those who don't know me, I'm Catherine Foreman Gray, History and Preservation Officer with Cherokee Nation. And we are in celebration of Native American History Month, uh, Native American Heritage Month. We are hosting uh, history presentations every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Um, today we have Shauna Kane, who is a Cherokee National Treasure for basket weaving. And uh, she's gonna be discussing the Cherokee National Treasures, uh, the history of the Cherokee National Treasures. So I apologize again for the late uh, start on all of this, but we had a little bit of difficulties with the um, PowerPoint. So um, this will go up and be archived, but I'm glad CNB's here. Maybe we can get some of that footage um, to have some of that uploaded online. So anyway, I will go ahead and introduce you, Shauna, if you're ready. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Let me get, I got the wrong PowerPoint pulled up. Well, I'm ready, but we don't have the correct PowerPoint up yet. Oh, sorry about that. I thought I had it. This is Roger Kane. My technical pro. It's that one. You have to click it with the icon. Okay, we're going to start off before he starts it. We're going to start off with a short uh, film. It's actually a PowerPoint film that was put together by the Cherokee Native Art and Plant Society, and it, I'll explain later how that's tied to National Treasures. And we have two college kids who donated their time to kind of put it together and do the sound over. Oh, I'm supposed to talk in the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to talk in the mic, they tell me. So, the first thing that you're going to see is about a 10 to 12 minute little video. It is two years old, and you'll see that when... Um, at the end when you see the treasures who are deceased that we're honoring. So when it comes to that part, just keep in mind it is two years old. Technical difficulties. There we go. We are here today to celebrate and honor our Cherokee National Treasures, our master artisans, our elders, our teachers. Since 1988, the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee Historical Society, and the Cherokee Heritage Center have annually honored Cherokee artisans with the title of Cherokee Living National Treasure. Today, Cherokee arts and culture continue to be kept alive by the efforts of our Cherokee Living National Treasures. Cherokee National Treasures are honored as master artisans for practicing, perfecting, and perpetuating traditional Cherokee arts and cultural traditions. The idea of recognizing individuals as Cherokee National Treasures emerged as part of the 36th annual Cherokee National Holiday in 1988. Under the administration of Chief Wilma Mankiller, an initiative began to preserve and perpetuate what many consider the lost arts of the Cherokee people. Chief Mankiller stated, it was difficult to differentiate between true Cherokee artists and people who imagined themselves Cherokee. What we were interested in at the time was not just the art itself, but the people who had the old values and also had the traditional knowledge that informs the art. The Cherokee National Treasures began as a result of the Lost Arts Project. Under the direction of Colonel Martin Hagerstrand, a consortium of artisans, Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee Heritage Center, and Northeastern State University, the Lost Arts Project was established. The Lost Arts Project Living exhibit originally demonstrated Cherokee art traditions of bow and gig making, Cherokee marbles, the cornstalk shoot, and the blowgun shoot. 
The goal of the Lost Arts Project and Cherokee National Treasures is to ensure the revival, preservation, and perpetuation of Cherokee cultural practices that may be lost in the passage of time. This project archives and preserves the knowledge, techniques, heritage, and commitment of the Cherokee National Treasures. Annabelle Sixkiller Mitchell is our only remaining original master artisan designated by the Lost Arts Project in 1988. She has served as an inspiration and role model to other national treasures as well as new and upcoming Cherokee artists. Her revitalization of our ancient Cherokee traditions in pottery have resulted in a resurgence of traditional ceramics as well as traditional design and motifs that were in jeopardy of being lost. Anna continues to teach and share her knowledge of our own southeastern art traditions from the ancient to the present. In 2009, a group of Cherokee National Treasures self-organized to establish a nonprofit organization through which Cherokee National Treasures work together to support and promote Cherokee elders, traditions, artistic expressions, and natural environments. The Cherokee Native Art and Plant Society Elders Advisory Board is instrumental in the operation of CNAPS. Their experience and wisdom is invaluable and provides leadership and cultural values. Betty Smith is the only Cherokee national treasure to receive the distinction as a master artisan in traditional food preparation. She and many other of our national treasures are always helpful in teaching us the right time and place to gather our traditional plants. Hunting and gathering our traditional plants is an art form that the Cherokee national treasures understand. They continue to teach us the value of our plants and their uses. As Cherokee National Treasure Dorothy Ice put it best, it doesn't matter how old you are, you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. Again. Can you tell us about go weed? All I know about it is that it cleans your system out. You, uh, you take seven plants and you boil it for about ten minutes and you drink, you drink the... In other words, laxative. <laughs> Yeah, it just, it just cleans your system. It, mm -hmm. So it's a laxative? Not really. It's a cleanser. It just, uh, like from, all these ladies, it's a cleanser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm happy you have this later. Yeah, but we're now tell me again, why is this well, not poison ivy right here? See, the five leaves. Let me get your finger. The five leaves right there. Mm -hmm. It's called the Virginia Creeper to practically trick people on the poison ivy thing because poison ivy only has three. It like this. Uh, where is it at? Like that. Oh. Like three leaves. Yeah, after all these years, I didn't know what poison ivy looked like. <laughs> so this is the Virginia Creeper right here. Yeah. And poison ivy only has three leaves. Okay. What about poison oak? Poison oak is practically the same thing as poison ivy just dropped up a tree. It still has three leaves just dropped up a tree. You know, in California, poison oak is everywhere. Cherokee National Treasures are mentoring youth and individuals of all ages. Here is Dorothy Ice and Lorene Drywater mentoring Camp Cherokee youth along the Barren Fork Creek during the summer of 2010. Currently, the Cherokee Heritage Center and the Cherokee Native Art and Plant Society are collaborating to revitalize the Cherokee Weavers Movement, teaching the history and art form of loom weaving. This project is an example of the Cherokee National Treasures working together to ensure that the tradition of loom weaving continues to flourish into the 21st century. Women Mills in uh, Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. using uh, machine motors. <laughs> but we didn't have any motors out there except engines with strong legs. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Let's 
The Cherokee Nation mourns the loss of three national treasure elders in 2010. We begin 2011 remembering each of their spirits, words, and inspiration to always treasure Cherokee history, language, culture, and art. We start that one on the top. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so the reason I showed you the film was because, first of all, um, I am going to talk a little bit about the nonprofits that kind of got all the research going on the national treasures, and also to brag on the two college students who helped us. That was Mary, oh Mary Grayson and Jamil Jasser. And they were working on their Cherokee there at the end. So before we move on to this PowerPoint, real quickly, I w I'd like to show you this board. And they tell me they can't hear me unless I put this on. So let me do that. I'll hold on to it. Can you hear me? No? Yeah? Okay. So this board here, it's our working board that we have of Cherokee National Treasures. What we have found, there is a book project that Cherokee Nation is working on right now. Actually, it's the National Treasures working on the book project. Cherokee Nation is allowing us to do it and funding it, which we're very excited about. And when we started this research, we found there were so many treasures that we did not have pictures or interviews or anything archived at all. And if you look at this board, you'll see some pictures and you'll see some seals. Well, where we have a seal, when we started, that meant we did not have a picture at all for this treasure, which is... It just almost seems like a crime. This program just started in 19... Like, crime, listen to me. But, you know, you, you get what I mean. The program started in 1988, and we had this many gaps. So we saw this as... And I'm going to explain who we are real quickly. We saw this as a problem, a concern. This is something that we need to grab a hold of now while we're still alive, and others are still alive who knew these people because they are Cherokee National Treasures. When you are um, inducted... What word did you want me to use? Not awarded. Designated. Designated. A Cherokee National Treasure. You are a Cherokee National Treasure all of your life and beyond. So um, that is a distinction that we as Cherokee Nation are the only Native tribe that, that, that has a National Treasure program, much less a program like this to honor artisans. Um, from the research we did, the only other place that has a similar program is in Japan. And they started it decades before Cherokee Nation did. And they even have an island where they all get to go live. So we're hoping that's our retirement plan. Cherokee Nation will build us an island. Okay, so my technical man's going to turn on the next PowerPoint. So those of you in the audience, we have some national treasures in the audience. And basically, uh, everyone here is pretty well you know, informed about the book project, about national treasures. So this should be fun. Talk and ask questions during or make points, please, if you have anything to say. We ready? I can push it as we go. Okay. Okay. Just push the down arrow? Uh -huh. Okay. All right. I'm not that technically literate. This picture I just start with because it was a banquet um, that we had in 2000. 10? 11. 11. Thank you. My husband Roger here is the number man. In 2011, honoring Cherokee National Treasures, and this was the group that would at least show up for the picture. There were a few others there, but they, they sneaked out before we took their picture. Uh, since this picture was taken, we have lost, how many, Jane, did we point out just now? Four or five? We've lost five. Four from this picture, I believe. Um, I would point them out. Uh, I will. <clears throat> We've lost Lucille Hare, Lou Weaver. We lost second from the end here, Lizzie White Killer, uh, Quilter. We lost Anna Six Killer Mitchell, Potter. I have to go through. We lost John Ketcher, second from the top row, 
you know, in the, in the jacket. He has passed away also. So from this picture, just since we started this project of recording national treasures, we have lost nine treasures total. So... <coughs> Okay, so in the other, in the film, it showed this group of people. What I'd like to point out is I became a treasurer in 2006. Before I was a treasurer, uh, I worked with National Treasures because I just loved art, and the teachers that I had were already National Treasures. Uh, the two basket weavers, Thelma Forrest in the far bottom corner and Bessie Russell up in the top corner, I knew them before this, before I was a treasurer. Um, the picture that's not up here are those of us that aren't elders. Um, Jane Austy was a national treasurer. What year, Jane? 2005. And Roger Kane, 2007. So what happened is um, after we started hanging out, Jane and Roger and I, it was like, what are we going to do? There's nothing, there's nothing for us to do as treasures. There's no way for us to organize and work together. So we started this little group, Cherokee Native Art and Plant Society. But because we didn't consider ourselves the elders, we went to these elders and asked them if they would guide us. And they did. And they did so very well. And in this picture, you'll see we've lost two of these people from our board. And that is John Ketcher and Anna Mitchell, right in the middle. Anna's in front of the nude, which is made by Bill Glass, another national treasure. Great sense of humor. That was her 80th birthday. Is that correct, Jane? And then, yes, we lost John. So, so this is the new uh, organization that we started about a year ago because we started the Native Art and Plant Society having no idea that we could start our own national treasure organization. So I am going to get to the history here, but this is where we are now. And this is the group of national treasures who have pulled together to try to do our best to archive and to have a permanent record, something that can be archived in many places. So, you know, a hundred years from now, We'll know who Alex England is. Alex England was one of the hardest ones for me to find anything about. So on this one, this was in the movie, or the movie, the, the one we just showed, the film. But we do like to talk about Woman Man Killer because she was principal chief at the time. And this, this quote, you know, the, up here, all the part in quote, that came from an article with Will Chavez that she did with him. And um, the thing about Wilma is, or I should say Chief Mankiller, because she's from Adair County, we all feel comfortable calling her Wilma, but she never took credit for the project, and she never said that she was the one behind it. However, if we look back at it historically, she was the principal chief, and had anyone else gone to the principal, it's up to the administrators to decide, yes, we would like to do this program. So whether she would take credit or not, we of course like to give her her kudos for all that she did to make it happen. I went the wrong way. So again, the big question was, there's always been a controversy over what's Tommy wake up? Tommy, poke him. Tommy Wildcat's asleep in the house. Yeah, we'll get lots of Facebook likes on that. Okay, so anyway, the lo I'm teasing you, babe, or Tommy. <laughs> it started with the Lost Arts Project, and that's something that I had no idea of until, you know, we started doing this research. Where did it start? Well, this was a project that really started before 1988, and you can read for yourself, you know, what is in quotes there came from that brochure, the little blue brochure that came out in 1988. And then also in 1988, they started the National Treasure uh, Program. So this picture is in honor of the groups that worked together to do it. This was not a Cherokee Nation program. It was not a Cherokee Historical Society program. It was not an arts council program. It was a program that started with grassroots people who we forget so easily. Linda Vann's picture should be in this also. There are so many people left out of this story that we have to rectify that. But the story the elders keep telling me over and over the more we interview is Martin Hagerstrand. And so everyone wants him to have a nod, and we're going to make sure we get his history. But he was not a Cherokee man. He was married to a Cherokee woman, Marion Hagerstrand. And they worked together, and in the opinion of a lot of the elders we talked to, National Treasures, 
they were very instrumental in getting this program started. And after that, NSU, it was their bilingual education program, uh, the Heritage Center, and then a grant from the Arts Council is kind of what got it all going. So it was a collaborative effort. So from that, from that um, same blue brochure, I sure wish it was on white because it doesn't look very good when you scan them. But if you start up in the corner, that's Hastings Shade. These were the art forms that were determined that first year in 1988 to be endangered or endangered of being lost. How to do it. So that's Hastings Shades making marbles. In the middle is a picture of Lee Foreman. He's actually in the background kind of standing. He's not the one shooting the marble there. But there he is doing Cherokee marbles. And um, next to that, we have the cornstalk shoot because bow making was very important. Um, William Cabbage Head down in the corner. He looks like he has his hands in the air. There's a blow gun in that hand, and he's shooting a blow dart. And I've never seen a picture of William Cabbage Head that far back. He was pretty healthy. And then Totem Hare is in the, the gentleman with the hat. I've gone around the circle here, and he, he received it for gigs. So in that first year, these were the art forms for the Lost Arts Project that were considered to be endangered. However, Anna must have come on the scene and told him, excuse me, you've forgotten pottery. I assume that's what happened, knowing Anna. And she was right. So the first year that... Four national treasures were picked the first year in 1988. They were Alex England for the cornstalk shoot. Alex England was from um, Adair County. Lyman Van for Cherokee Marbles. And I know that Lyman was around from Cloud Creek, right? Yeah. And William Cabbage Head, from what I understand, he lived around the river area. He's lived in Cherokee County. But see, that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to find out more and more about the lives of these deceased treasures because every one of these from the first year are now deceased. So, and lastly, of course not lastly, I should have put her first, Anna Six Killer Mitchell for pottery. So this one kind of cracks me up <laughs> because it's the actual legislation, which is hard to read, but is the exact, it is the, a copy of it. And it, if you look down at the date, um, what day was it? I can't even read it. Something like the 15th of August, they, um, the tribe, it went to tribal council, and the resolution number and everything is on there, 74 dash looks like 8-8. You can look it up in the archives. I did. And it's signed by John Ketcher when he was deputy chief, and no, he wasn't. He was a council member. Gary Chapman and Wilma Mankiller. So uh, if, you, if you do read the fine lines, it was a unanimous. Everyone voted yes. And the reason it's funny to us National Treasures is it was signed on August 15th. National Treasures have to be picked by holiday. So even in 90, 1988, they were running on Indian time. So there are many categories represented. I sure hope I've got them all here. I went over it and over it and over it. And I'm not going to bore you with reading them. And in fact, I've got pretty pictures. We have loom weaving. Um, that's from the 1930s to the present. So is that a traditional art? That's something we talk about often. We think so. Basketry. Pottery. Stickball sticks and gigs. That would also be the ball, of course, for the stickball sticks. Bow and arrow. Some received it for making bows. Others received it for being able to shoot, you know, to be very good cornstalk shooters. And there's quilting. Um, those quilts are by Polly White Killer, the one with the syllabary. Uh, that's Margaret Wilson holding up her blue, very beautiful cape there. Uh, cape. Where did that come from? Quilting. And then the last one is Bessie Russell's, the one with the acorns. And it's pretty cool. She used camouflage, you know, like she's taking a traditional art form and kind of making it contemporary. We have blow guns and darts and flint napping. Those are Noel Grayson's flint naps. Those are William Cabbage Head's darts and um, gun. And then the picture of the lady is Betty Frog. She's the president of our nonprofit association. And that's back in the days when, she, in her story, she brags about being able to beat the men at the holiday cornstalk shoot. And I love the way she's got the blow dart stuck in her hair. Oh, wrong way. Okay, carving and mass making. 
they're not one category, but just for the time's sake, carving, comma, mask making. Traditional clothing and dolls. And, um, you know, Lorraine, you see Lorraine's dolls right there in the corner. We all know Lorraine's dolls. She actually got the, she received National Treasure for traditional clothing. However, on her dolls, you see she's putting tear dresses on her dolls. And that's another thing I should mention. Um, we have Wendell Cochran's another one who received it for traditional clothing. And then he'll corner you and let you know, hey, I do a lot more than traditional clothing. So that's another thing to remember about treasures, the national treasures, artisans. Just because they received this distinction for one art doesn't mean that's the only art that they do or even the one that they feel that they're the best at doing. And, of course, for the, the I thought you'd all laugh at Roger up there, practically nude. Up in the corner, I had to add him from our fashion show, just to embarrass him. And then we have traditional foods. We only have one treasure. As the film said, Betty Smith is the only national treasure to ever receive this distinction for traditional foods. However, there's Edith Catcher Knight in this picture, and she received a national treasure for clothing. She's wearing her dress, but she's the only treasure we know right now who has her own traveling canone or her own pounder to make kanuchi. Another category, doxy and Cherokee marbles. Again, they're separate categories, but for time. And then a new one that was added um, after 2009, I guess, uh, was the Cherokee language. It was one that I guess had been overlooked as an art form. But of course now it's being embraced and we have quite a few treasures who have received this for national uh, for language. And then another thing, we talk about traditional all the time and that's not, this is the time or place and we don't have the time, but we always talk about as treasures, what is traditional? You know, how far back do we have to go? Do we have to go back to banging rocks together? And I meant that totally sarcastic. Or are we talking about how can we, how can a painting be traditional? Well, in this example, it's a Donald Van painting, and it's a painting kind of in the 70s style, the very flat painting, and it's a stickball game. And then we have the beadwork by Martha Berry. Again, these are the national treasures from this year, from 2013. In Martha Berry's bag, you know, there was a lot of controversy. Did Cherokees bead? <clears throat> well, treasures did investigation on that and found a lot of sources. Well, not a lot, but enough to justify, yeah, we, d we did do the this. We made the bandolier bags. So the, and then we have Tommy, Tommy Wildcat, who's awake, I think, because he heard his name. Yep. <laughs> and he's there. And Tommy, how long ago was that picture taken? Uh, 2005. Okay, 2005. And I grabbed that off internet because we still have to get a professional photo of you. Uh, I could have grabbed the one of you, the horse, off Facebook, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the little kitty horse. I'm teasing. And then the last picture is one of Cecil Dick. And, um, you know, Cecil Dick received it posthumously or posthumously. And um, in this picture, how else are you going to depict medicine? It's called the curing, and it's just a bit of the picture. It was a mural. And by using these images that are teaching us about traditional practices from the, the past, that's how painting was added to a traditional art form. So that there was a lot of debate about that, a lot, among treasures. I keep pushing the wrong button, excuse me. Am I pushing the wrong button still? Again, excuse me. Okay, so here's where the nonprofits come in. You know, I showed you the Native Art and Plant Society and the National Treasure Association. Well, because of this book project, it really made us see, as I showed you on the board here, that we're not documenting enough. When this program started, the original purpose was, or goals and objectives, I should say, were, to go out and interview and videotape and audio tape and get as much as possible of these elders, of these artisans, but it didn't happen, or if it did happen, they were lost. We just don't know. We have very little of it. So here's what we're looking for. You can read for yourself, but we do want we, we want those mannerisms, you know. And you're going to see a few elders speaking here in just a moment in a couple of these slides that come by. And you know, there's just no way. Here I am trying to type what they've said and put it in a written form. You just can't capture Indian humor. I mean, some of these stories sound sad and pathetic, but they're not. We're laughing all the way through them. So it's very hard to capture that. So we're trying as much as possible to get those mannerisms, the uniqueness, the Cherokee voice, and it's very diverse. 
And of course you can read all the rest, but, but we're looking for all these things. We're not just looking for a story about the art. We're looking for stories about the people and everything that, I don't know, turned them on to doing the art and sharing it. So, there's, uh, we, we saw that this is just an example of some of the archiving we're trying to start doing, like Betty Smith and her traditional food preparation. Well, we're not just looking at food preparation, but then that led us to, oh, you have to go gather that food. You can't buy Cochani at Walmart. You definitely can't get Kanuchi anymore unless you know somebody. And so we, we also document that. And medicinal herbs. We just put a few here, but it's just unbelievable how many National Treasure elders, male and female, know their plants. They just do. And the, and when we're talking about medicine here, we're not talking about um, medicine. We're talking about remedies, health remedies. You know. So, you know, if you have a cough, if you have uh, liver problems, if you have, anyway. We're not talking about stomp ground medicine. She handed me the, the doll that she finished. I was carrying it like this, and oh my, that was the most beautiful doll I have ever owned. Because this was the, uh, the dress for my doll. That's, oh, that's how it looked. And, uh, and uh, the, the grass uh, that she made was a little bit, little bit more bunched than this one. And uh, she uh, put it in there for her arms. And... Uh, I played with that thing. I mean, oh my! It was like a, uh, every time we go off somewhere to visit to Grandma up on the mountain, and uh, the reason I like this here is because that's how I climbed the mountain mm -hmm. to go visit my grandmother. <laughs> mountain here, I mean, I seem like forever, and then. Uh, on the on on a foot trail through there, uh, there'd be lots of this grass, and I bet. Uh, Mama, next time we'll come, bring hoe. And okay, we we'll bring hoe. Next time we we'll walk up that way, no hoe. <laughs> but that grass made my feet itch. <laughs> <laughs> So just a short example there of mannerisms. You know, when it comes time for that to be typed, it just doesn't hold the cake, you know, to actually watching and seeing Laureen talk. Here's a little bit more of her telling some of her secrets. The wind don't blow this away because I've got this on here. And to hold it down, put a red brick on there. So I'll fill those up. And that one way over there, and this one right here, and this one. Mm. Get them all filled up, and uh, I love doing this. Oh, no, it just looks fun. Yeah, yeah, because my mama taught me how to do this. So, you know, we got so much information in that little snippet there. And uh, that is buffalo grass on the little wagon trailer. And that is enough buffalo grass after it's died to make maybe four dolls. So, Laureen's still, and she's 81, right? She's 81, and she still digs her own grass. And we try to get together as other treasurers and volunteers to help her. And it takes about two or three truckloads of buffalo grass for her to make it through a year. And she sells her dolls anywhere from 25 to 30. We can't get her to go up. She's still in the 1980s. And I don't know what else to say about her, except she's a great salesperson. And here comes that part. We can go gather it. So you can make it Sometimes uh, the whole yard is full of it, and uh, people don't know how to get rid of it. Well, just let us know about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll come and get it. Yeah. And she means that. And we put a call out to Facebook every last two years, and we've had nibbles, but we sure need some help helping Lorraine keep her grass stocked up. And, again, that's buffalo grass. Okay. Again, what we talked about early was the documenting the cultural tradition. Um, you know, remember in the Wilma Mankiller quote, she talks about um, the information. Well, what informs the traditional art? And again, 
it has so much more to do than just making a pot or just making a basket. And I hate to use the word just, but a lot of people think that's all there is to it. There's a whole knowledge system behind it. And the, these are some of the ways that we are gathering documentation, audio, video, transcriptions being from people who videoed in the, or interviewed in the past, uh, heirloom pictures, that just means pictures that, historic pictures, pictures of family, anything like that. And the main thing is we want the stories as they tell them. Uh, that's what one thing we're finding in documentation, the bit that has been done. The interviewer comes in and interviews the treasure and then takes snippets of what the treasure says and fills in the rest themselves. Like, you know, I saw him cock his head back and laugh with a toothless grin, and I just want to go slap, slap. Just, just give us their words. We don't need your, your description. So... Corrida de Gesta, Enneke, Peito de Desco, Desca, Kiwile Desco. Não foi de Dega, as quando é, né, Kiwile. As vezes em Corrida de Gano, você, a Ninho, né, na rua, é nele, isso. Corrida de Gesta, isso que eu nasci. Não foi de Dani, então, Enneke, Kiwile de Dani, Gisca. Corrida de Gano, você, ele, Dani, Gisca. As vezes em Corrida de Gesta, Kiwile, a Corrida de Dani, Gisca, então, First of all, I'd like to thank Harry Ossoway for doing that translation for us. He did it several years ago. Um, and the reason I point Anna and Jack Kilpatrick, you know, I, I bring notice to them, is that if you don't know who they are, you need to know. And you need to Google them and you need to read some of their work. They are among, well, not among, they basically are the only Cherokees who were also ethnographers. And they went and they interviewed Cherokees. So as you see this man, his name was, I guess, Galutz. It's the best I can do. Thank you. Will you say that again? Okay, thanks, Candessa Tihi Galudge. I've been saying that wrong for about three years now. But he was 60, again, because I'm reading it instead of hearing it. He was 67 at the time. He was male, a married farmer, and his English was fair. So that's what we do know about him. We also know that he was living around where Lake Tinkiller uh, flooded all of his land, so he had to move. And we can also pull from this. This was the summer of 61. He's 67, and he's talking about when he was a young man. So when he was a young man, there was this thing called mast in the woods, and he talks about how the hogs were let go in the woods to fatten themselves. And this is just knowledge that, that we would not have otherwise had the Kilpatricks not gone out and done what they did. But I would love to hear some audio recordings. I point them out because they deserve the kudos. They just didn't matter what. And the, the elders are the ones that I used to like to dance with because they knew how. They were good. Mm -hmm. Because I already knew how I started when I was probably about two or three or something like that when mm -hmm. I started. And then when I was eight years old, of course, I stomp danced before that, but I didn't start wearing the doxies until I was eight after my grandma finished her ritual thing, after she finished her ritual thing, and she'd tell me, come on, sit down. She'd put those on me. She'd put toe sacks around my legs first and then, then put the dox. Okay, I know we, we cut that off, but just for time, teaching through stories. Again, back to the Kilpatricks. This is what we're trying to do now. We're trying to record and just get the stories of the elders and draw from those stories all we can. Um, at the time, all I asked Dorothy was, how'd you get started? And from that, she took off and told her story. Something I learned from that was that they used tote sacks. or uh, I'm picturing those really rough sacks that... Tell me, Sue, what? Burlap sacks, exactly. And so it's just a neat little, all kinds of things. Like another thing in her story is she would come back and say, okay, I remember the name of that oil. It's cool, K-O-O-L, oil, which to us might not seem important, but I, I repeat this to other elders, and they're like, yeah, I remember we used that. And that was for inside the house to heat the house, kerosene oil. So Bessie Russell, she's one of my mentors. Again, I met Bessie long before I was a treasure, and... Bessie's a little old bitty woman, but she scares me to death, and we do everything she tells us to do. And in this next one slide, you know, I've asked her, what is it that makes something traditional? So this is her view of what a traditional basket maker should be able to do. It, to, call, to be able to call yourself a traditional basket weaver, you know, 
you need to gather your own material, you know, go out and get your own read and, and uh, process it the way it needs to be processed. And even if you know how to get it, there's a difference in knowing how to get it and then, and doing it yourself, you know. <laughs> I, I, that's what. That's why I feel about it. I feel like I, I can totally say I'm a traditional basket maker if I don't go out and get my own weed. And die. And die. So Bessie feels real strongly about that, and she's in a buckbrush patch in that top picture. She does make commercial baskets, but she doesn't believe you can call yourself a traditional weaver if you can't go out and gather your own materials. And there are a lot of us that feel that way. You need to at least know how. But again, that was her view. Uh, this next picture is a day that we were at Lorreen Drywater's house, which... Bessie already has the mark. Don't even ask to go get any honeysuckle there. They got a deal worked out. I don't know what they're trading. But this was a day that we all worked together. Thelma Forrest is there, you see. It was a day of national treasures all showing up to help another basket weaver. And that that's about what the honeysuckle looks like. Those are huge, long, you know, vines there. Down here. And we also get these great pictures of them playing and having fun, you know. So this is Bessie tying... Um, Obviously, tying Laureen up with, a, with some honeysuckle. And it's fun. Very fun to catch these candid moments. And then at the end, this is Victory. This is Bessie with her daughter. Um, that's, that's Vicky, right? Yes, that's Vicky, her elder daughter. And you can see we're filling up her truck trunk with honeysuckle. And just so you know, all of that honeysuckle doesn't go a long way. That won't make too many baskets. So we're getting close. We're on slide 39 of 50. I'll go faster. So another thing that we saw, I say we, when I say we, this is an inclusive national treasures who, who feel this need to make sure that we are teaching and perpetuating and listening to those elders that tell us we need to be doing this, and some are gone now, and we're still doing it. But this was from a few years ago. Jane was there, I remember. Laureen was at this one. And let me just show you some of what they did. So that was just a little, it didn't look like much because it's pretty hard to get a picture of throwing an addle but the boys at Marietta were throw, able to throw it almost across the whole football field by the time they were finished. So those were addle If you don't know what that is, it's a throwing stick. Uh, it predates the bow and arrow. And th they made the spears and they made the little addle out of wood. And then they went outside and played with them. Played with them, practiced, I should have said. And then we have other mentoring things that we do. Sometimes we mentor, like this is a boy from Adair County, and I asked Bessie, can you come over and they've got some land, so what did she do? She taught this young man how to gather butt brush, and he's still doing it now. Then there's Thelma there in the corner, and that's her granddaughter, Lainey. So, you know, we try to pick, pick kids, youth, who are super interested in it. We're not interested in a make-it-take-it. It. We're interested in a long-lasting relationship, an apprenticeship, maybe. So this is something that will last and carry on. Mail it to me. Okay. Mail it to me. All right. I'll let you mail it to me. Will you get a piece of paper and start it around? I will. Oh, hey, why are you going to knock me out? Okay. So that was a summer camp at Marietta, and Dorothy Ice, uh, we got a little grant, actually it was a grant from Cotta, that allowed us to afford at least to buy all the tomato cans. My lord, we were all freezing tomato sauce forever, because we had to empty all those cans out to make those shells, or not shells, cans. And you'll notice that she's teaching through cans, not through doxy, or not through shells, because... To Dorothy, those are sacred. Well, to, to all of us, they're sacred. But in this school setting, we made sure that we used cans, so we're teaching the art, teaching the tradition. And the kids, of course, took to it. That was their first little go-around. And um, if they are interested and want to pursue it further, then we may just do doxies. It's up to them. 
So uh, these you saw in the last film, but it's just crucial to show them again really quickly. Uh, this is Camp Cherokee, and boy, it was hot, wasn't it, Jane? Yeah, we all about died. It was like the hottest summer two years ago, and right in July. And you see Lorraine and Dorothy. They were our elders, and they were our teachers. So you saw this. But you have this later. Now tell me again, why is this well, not poison ivy right here? See, the five leaves. Let me get your finger. The five leaves right there. Mm -hmm. It's called the Virginia Creeper to practically trick people on the poison ivy thing because poison ivy only has three. It like this. Uh, what is that? Like that. Now that was no news to our elders, Dorothy and Lorraine, but the rest of us that were there, we were really happy. That little girl taught us a lot, so now we know the difference. But going back to Dorothy Ice, we always quote her uh, because she says it often, you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. And that was just a situation where the elders were doing the teaching and gosh darn it, the kids weren't teaching back. It was a pretty neat moment. And again, you saw this one, but it's a shorter version. Oh, no, we have, no, no, this is important. So we were right there by the river, and we were using some people's land there that let us meet there. It wasn't Cherokee Nation land. And they told us at this camp, don't let them go swimming. Don't let them go swimming. Dorothy and Lorraine said, let them go swimming. So we did. And every day they came, they went back wet. So if nothing else, we taught those kids how to swim in the creek. And it was fun. And it was important. I guess that's why I put it in there. It was important. It was that extra connection to nature that they needed to know that that's part of being out in the hot, too, is to have fun and enjoy the water and how clean it was, and it was that day. So, again, we're documenting things like we're learning that you have to follow someone a year because we're learning, oh, you can only do certain things during certain times of the month. Like in that last film when the girls teach in Virginia Creeper. We had no idea in the middle of July that was the worst time to take a bunch of kids out to identify plants. You know, the, most of the plants that we would want to show them, that wouldn't be, the, it would be early spring or early fall or a really cold part of winter. And I see some heads shaking, so you know that. That seasonality is very important. And if, we, if you just run in and, and interview a treasure or any elder and run out, you're going to miss so much. You have to keep that relationship going through the whole year, at least one year, so you can learn more. And this, again, is Dorothy picking anything she can to talk about because about it is it's July. It cleans your system out. You, uh, you take seven plants and you boil it for about ten minutes and you drink, you drink the... In other words, laxative. We love that look. She's looking at Lorraine like, what do you mean laxative? No, it's not a laxative. And then you saw that discussion. They talked that out. So again, documenting seasonality. That's something we realized we haven't been doing. We as Cherokee people, as Native people, the way that our traditions roll is upon seasonality. You know, we don't live in this Western world of nine to five. We live in a seasonal world of season to season. And we have so many more than four seasons we're finding. For example, bloodroot, that's another one. You know, we call it indigenous knowledge systems. And, you know, that's something I'm working on in my dissertation, is that indigenous knowledge systems and the people who know them are equivalent to any PhD who is in a classroom learning from a book. So that is kind of the emphasis of not only my studies, but it's something I've learned from these elders. And this is the next to the last slide. So we'll end it with... We, we have begun the Cherokee National Treasure Association, we being a group of national treasures, a sizable group, and uh, some people who volunteer and who've stepped up and who help us. So we ha we've started this organization, and we're a year and a few weeks old right now. And th these are some of the things we try to do. Of course, we want to per perpetuate traditional arts, teaching and mentoring, and especially documenting Cherokee elders for the future. So there's our information. If you'd like it, I'll leave that up. And leave a message on the phone because we never answer it. But if you leave a message, we'll be back with you. So that is the end of my presentation, but I could go on for days. So do we have any questions or comments? Was I that good or that bad or was it informative? <laughs> Come on, any questions at all? 
All right, then I'm going to, I thought you would say, when's the book going to come out, somebody? So there will be a book about Cherokee National Treasures, and we expect that it will be out in the spring. And in this book, every treasure, again on this board, everyone will be represented, deceased or living, and no, it won't. We won't distinguish in the book who is alive and who is not. It's going to be a timeless book. Everyone's alive in this book. So if, we, if the person is not alive for us to interview and talk to, we're talking to a friend or family member or other treasure to tell us stories about them. So it's a book of stories by National Treasures, for National Treasures, for Cherokees, and to teach others about our Cherokee National Treasures elders and artisans. So look for that in the spring. I'm going to say that on the mic, Tommy, since that might not have caught you. Tommy Wildcat was pointing out that most of these treasures, their parents, could you repeat? Yes, yeah, their parents. Okay, so their parents were? Indian Territory. Oh, Indian Territory born. Okay, yes. Yes, yes. And um, I, I believe the first one in the book, we're, we're doing the book chronologically, so we're starting with our oldest treasure. We're doing it by birth date. And, Roger, can you help me out? But what's the date? Alex England, 1904, was his birth. So, birth date. My very awesome. So Tommy's father um, was born in 1922, which we we still have to interview you about your father. And he was a national treasure. In what year, Tommy? Uh, I always have to look. 2005. So in 2005, he was awarded. Or again, I, Roger keeps telling me not to say awarded. Distinguished with the honor of being a national treasure. And something I didn't say I meant to. When you become a national treasure, you don't know you're going to be one. It's not something you apply for. It's not something that you can ask to be. It is something that someone else who is a, a Cherokee citizen can nominate you for. Um, see, I'm just editing in my head right now. <laughs> about we can no longer have any UKB national treasures because of some legislation then. And that is bothersome to me as an individual, but this is not a political platform. But we do have UKB and Cherokee Nation people as national treasures. And um, that stopped about six years ago. And now this distinction can only be given to those who hold a blue card. And that is part of our history. And no matter, yeah, that's part of our history. So you need to know that. Terrible, end, terrible note to end on, though. What can we end on? Any, any, uh, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and that We are, as National Treasures, working to change that. If nothing, if nothing else, to at least uh, rectify the wrong that has been done to those National Treasures who were UKB when they were chosen to be a National Treasure, they right now are not really considered active National Treasures in that... Their artwork cannot be bought by Cherokee Nation. So that's an initiative we're working on very strongly, and you should be hearing about that in Tribal Council soon, as treasures were banding together to say, hey, we want those UKB grandfathered in because they were chosen as national treasures, and they are treasures, and, yeah, we would like to see them as equals. So as far as tackling future UKB, we're not there yet. We got one battle at a time. So, And, again, that was just changed six years ago. So it's a new thing. But thanks for that question. And that was my own personal opinion. And there are other treasures that might feel differently, but we have a, a large number that feel the way I do about it. So that's a good place to end, though. So we're going to make some changes, rectify some wrongs. So thank you very much. That's the end. I'll go ahead and end by uh, saying next week at Tuesday at 2 p.m., uh, Roger Kane, who is also a Cherokee national treasure, will be doing a presentation on the um, Cherokee Nation River Cane Initiative, correct? So he'll have a lot of um, information about that as well. So does anyone have any questions for me? No? Uh-huh.
Um, are there any other, other bands besides the Corey and Vermont and, and uh, my aunt Maddie Brown, everybody should know Maddie Brown, and my father Tom, their brother is the National Treasury. Oh. Can you come answer that? Yeah. I can answer that. <clears throat> you know, Tommy? That is a very good question, and it's one we never thought of before until we started researching for the book. But there are many family members, and um, there are not that many father-son combinations. You're one. Uh, do you know any other father-son? We have several mother-daughter, you know, who both receive national treasure. But yes, so much inner. Can- I'm sorry. Hastings and Richard Shader cousins, yes, yes. Hastings, Shade, and Richard Shader cousins. But again, we have that family, but it does seem that some families seem to carry these traditions, I, I hate to say more, but they carry these traditions on and pass them down to their children or to other family members because it is amazing how much interconnectedness there is. I might be interviewing, you know, uh, I was interviewing Lena, Lena Blackbird, and then I'm telling her, I cannot find this guy anywhere and it was her brother Scott Ratcliffe so yeah it's pretty amazing how many how many family interconnectedness you know how much of that but one thing that does not happen is family cannot pick family and it might have happened in the past but if it did it was really controversial and it didn't happen again so the board that does pick the national treasures you're not allowed to vote on a family member so that keeps it clean and honest so good question though Tommy Anything else? I just want to personally thank you guys for what you do. Um, Roger and Shauna and, and Tommy as well have. Uh, I have a son who's really into bow making, and they are. They have just been embracing that wonderfully, and and um, you guys are great. So thank you guys for that. Any other questions? I guess we'll go ahead and sign off here if we're if we're finished. But next Tuesday, 2 p.m., it'll be Roger. Will be up. All right. Did you start?